All right, good morning. My name is Aparna Sinha, and I lead product management for the Kubernetes open source project at Google, um, as well as the hosted version of that um, in Google Cloud. So, uh, and this is my Twitter handle, AP Putnagar, uh, in case you want to follow me or, uh, you know, reach out to me there. So, uh, Diane asked me to talk about Kubernetes 1.8 and beyond. So, what is happening in 1.9 and what's happening next year. I wanted to start with a question that actually my husband asked me um, just the other day. He said, you know, you lead Kubernetes for Google. It sounds like, you know, it's kind of popular. I saw it on Hacker News. Why is it popular? Do you understand why users like and why do they choose Kubernetes? It sounds like a complicated name and maybe a complicated <laughs> technology. So I started thinking about that and I wrote down a few reasons, you know, that I've heard in other talks. Well, it's open source, so what you see is what you get. It's got a great community, you know, Red Hat is part of it. There's lots of other companies, so you know that it's a project that's going to go on. Um, there are very frequent releases. This can be a pro and a con, but we have a release every three months. But that means that the, you're getting new features. Um, actually, the technology makes it efficient to use your underlying hardware. So, um, you know, some people use it because of that reason. And then it runs anywhere. Um, and then lastly, it's fast deployment. So these are all reasons that I've heard and you've heard and probably experienced some of these. But I think that there's a, there's a real reason here which is behind all of this uh, and more important than, than, than others. So what is that reason? I think to understand that, and we had a great talk by TELUS, that was a good example. Um, let's take a look at what enterprise IT environment looks like. And the more I talk to users, the more I understand this, particularly large enterprise IT environments, there is a lot of different types of applications, a lot of different versions of operating systems, not a lot of upgrades. It's a fairly complicated environment. And I've worked in that environment for the early part of my career. Um, and it's, it's not easy. But what I've seen is that every enterprise um, IT organization is interested in the latest. They want to be able to do things quickly. They want to latch on to the most, um, most compelling technology. And it's important for their business, so, so, so they do that. But often it takes two to three years. I've heard customers tell me it takes two to three years to introduce that new technology. And at the end of that, it doesn't actually give you the benefits that, 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 you, that you sought. So that's the status that I've seen. And I think we heard that a little bit from TELUS as well. Um, so I think the reason that people choose Kubernetes, and, and my husband actually kind of educated me on this, is because of this last thing, the fast deployments. If in an enterprise environment that is pretty complicated, you can get in there and you can do kubectl apply-f and you know, everything deploys, you can deploy many, many times a day. And the TELUS folks told us that they went from deploying once a week to deploying 400 times a day. That's a huge change. And I've seen many customers tell me, you know, we did that demo, you know, my CIO got up and he showed that to the board and for the first time we had something that worked really quickly and gave us the benefits. So I think when you can do that, you look like a superhero. That's why I have that, that superhero costume here. So that's great, you know, that's wonderful. Um, you know, the next thing my husband asked me, okay, so, so, to, so you can deploy faster, great. So one day that's hopefully gonna become ubiquitous and then, you know, you can retire and <laughs> hopefully there'll be other things on top of Kubernetes. And I do hope that, I do hope that it becomes ubiquitous um, and, and disappears. That's, that's my hope for the future of Kubernetes. But the reality is that Kubernetes is a small section of the enterprise today. The present reality is a very hybrid, mixed reality. There is a lot of traditional enterprise IT there's a lot of virtualized, non-containerized systems. And then there's a small portion that's fully managed and, and optimized for containers that's running Kubernetes. And that exists because of that, that great deployment benefit. Um, but in fact, our system has to live in this, in this reality. So back to my topic, which Diane asked me to talk about, 1.8, 1.9, what are we doing? Um, this, has to, this has to be based on this reality, and I think it is. Our community is looking at what matters to customers and how can we build a project that actually caters to those needs. So I think, you know, a lot of customers um, want to move to the cloud, whether it's a private cloud or it's a public cloud. They want to move 
as they can. There's a lot of workloads that are on-premise that, um, that want to have that developer productivity, that want to have that benefit on-premise, and OpenShift provides that. They also want a consistent environment. They want to have the same environment in the cloud as they do on-premise. Why? Because they don't have to t t train their teams twice or thrice for multiple environments, both their operations teams and their developer teams. And Kubernetes is a good base for that. But then at the end of the day, every enterprise needs something that's secure, that's private, and auditable. So these are actually the principles that also drive the Kubernetes roadmap as it matures as a product. How can we make sure that users can use it in any environment so that they can move where they want to at their own pace? How can we make sure that their services run everywhere? There's a huge, huge effort there um, in the community around Kubernetes conformance, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then how can we make sure that it's private and it's secure and it's auditable? And that OpenShift is quite, quite ahead in those, in those areas. So the themes for the last two releases of um, Upstream Kubernetes, 1.8 and 1.9, 1.9 is coming out in a week, um, were stability and conformance, security, and extensibility. And as you can see, these play to those needs. We're really trying hard as a community to make sure that Kubernetes fits in with the environment and can enable um, its users to expand that footprint. So it can enable Telus to go from 200 applications to all of their applications. So I'm going to go through some of the features. In 1.8, uh, really along the lines of the themes of, secure, of, of stability, we really matured the security uh, framework. So role-based access control moved to GA, or stable, which means that you know, it has um, a long-term API stability guarantee, uh, not a lot of changes, a lot of maturity that happened there, and it becomes on by default. Also, network policy, and Clayton actually covered a lot of these things in, in, in Clayton and um, Matt or Mike, I think they covered a lot of this in their talk. Um, network policy is a great uh, builder or building block for, uh, for security um, at, the, at the pod level, at the L3, L4 level, to be able to uh, say which pods can talk to which pods. And then, um, as we look forward, combining that with Istio, you also get the east-west security and the ability to set policies at an L7 level. And that really truly gets to a compelling enterprise product that has that has end-to-end uh, -end security. Um, so that, that's one, uh, maturing the security, and I think that's going to continue through the at least the first half of 2018. Um, second uh, piece under uh, st stability is the graduation of the workloads API. So the workloads API uh, is actually broken into two. There's the apps API and the batch API. Apps consists of deployments, which has been one of the longest standing um, objects in, in Kubernetes. It's finally graduating to stable as part of the overall apps workloads API. So deployments, daemon sets, replica sets, and stateful sets. Um, all four of those are graduating to stable in a couple of weeks, which is a huge accomplishment. And what, is, what, is, what the community has done there is to really rationalize those, make sure that they're consistent with each other, um, and you know, they'll be available by default in 1.9. And I think what, what's really cool is that, you know, again, deployments and replica sets are the oldest and, and very broadly used. People are always asking me, when are you moving that to stable? Why is that not stable already? Um, but stateful sets, actually, and daemon sets, these are newer. And um, that, th that the community is, has brought those forward together, I think, really shows our commitment to, um, to allowing you to run all of these workloads side by side together in one environment. And that's the whole consistency and resource efficiency benefit. Uh, batch workloads has also moved forward. So cron jobs um, finally moved to beta, and we expect that to move to stable over the course of next year. So that's, that's, that's on stability. The second piece here is on extensibility. So CRDs replace TPRs. We have a lot of th three-letter acronyms. <laughs> um, I'm not even sure that I, I can keep them. Custom resource definitions um, is, is CRDs, which is a, um, you know, and that's now moved to beta. That's a uh, great way of extending um, uh, Kubernetes. Uh, replaced uh, third-party resources, which was a previous version. Uh, but the, the real, um, just behind this, the thrust behind it is to allow you to extend Kubernetes 
um, to add a custom API or a custom resource or a custom controller um, to Kubernetes. And I think this is particularly important um, uh, in consuming the rest of the Kubernetes ecosystem. So for example, if you want to run Service Catalog or you want to run Istio on top of Kubernetes, along with Kubernetes, and these are ways to extend um, your Kubernetes environment to non-Kubernetes environment. Uh, you use CRDs or you use some of these extension mechanisms to run those pieces on top of Kubernetes. Uh, so those are the three, I would say, major things, maturing security, uh, maturing applications and workloads, and extensibility and in, in 1.8. Um, there were also experimental features, experimental features being alpha features, uh, so particularly in scheduling, priority and preemption move to alpha, and I think it will continue to graduate. Um, this really gives you more sophisticated scheduling capabilities, and we've been working on that over the course of this year. I think where that really takes us is, is towards multi-tenancy, so that you will be able to schedule multiple different uh, types of workloads and types of users inside the same cluster hopefully a larger cluster, and get a lot more resource efficiency from that cluster. Um, and then the storage, storage SIG has done a lot of maturation. Um, I think uh, Clayton talked about local storage, which is important, of course, for stateful workloads, but also the definition of the CSI, the, the standard, the uh, storage interface standard, which allows many enterprise storage vendors to plug in to Kubernetes and develop those plugins out of tree so that, so that they don't have to be part of the Kubernetes core, giving it greater extensibility and stability. And then um, lastly, really in the area of workloads, um, there's a lot of expanding work in Kubernetes on supporting big data um, through Spark um, and, and also through uh, supporting GPUs and ML. So I think that's going to be a huge theme in the coming year. These are some of the uh, overview. That's actually just an overview. I have a little bit more detail, but I won't go through all of it. I think everyone is aware of what role-based access controls are and it's a it's a GA feature. It allows admins to really dynamically define roles and enforce them um, at a very granular level on resources, on pods, on specific namespaces um, within Kubernetes. It's a very rich um, security uh, security uh, feature. And then network policy. Um, the I talked about network policy already. The um, the the, the combination of network policy and Istio really provides that end-to-end -end security. And a, a lot of these network policy implementations, like Calico, um, can be used not only for Kubernetes, but also for the rest of your infrastructure. So again, talking about hybrid, you want to set network policy on um, services that may be running on bare metal. Um, Istio as well it, it, it can be used beyond uh, Kubernetes, so to set east-west communication for services that are not running in Kubernetes. And the same thing with Open Service Broker, again, that allows you to bring in um, services that are potentially legacy services or services that are running in VMs. And so that you, you can see how Kubernetes is um, adopting these open source uh, pieces that allow you to have that hybrid environment. Uh, this is the workloads API. I talked about this. So this has kind of been the road to GA. And uh, in 1.8, everything moved to uh, we, V1 beta 2. And then in 1.9, we're moving to stable. And, and the, the, I think the, the key piece here is um, Kubernetes is an open source project. It really moves at a frenetic pace. And a lot of times, users don't have visibility into what's coming, coming in the future. We're trying to provide a sort of format for how we graduate APIs. And the Workloads API is an example of that. So we sort of you know, move it into a group. We, we go to beta 1, and then we go to beta 2. And then we go to kind of stable, and that's the first version. And then it has a long-term deprecation policy. So we're trying, again, to provide a framework that we intend to use for other APIs as well. So this is a good example of how we're bringing stability uh, extensibility, uh, and this is an example uh, of um, how the um, uh, extensions of the, uh, of the API server can be used, for example, um, for service catalog. So uh, you have a great, you have an excellent API in the form of the Kubernetes API. If you could extend that with, um, you know, your own custom APIs or uh, bringing in things like the, the service catalog, which is um, a SIG in and of itself, and it provides you the ability to essentially uh, bring in a whole other API. In this case, to create services, to bind to services, and uh, Clayton talked about this as well. Uh, this is very powerful. Um, it, you know, you can bring in any kind of um, uh, 
third-party API or your own APIs. Uh, and they look just like Kubernetes APIs, and they're accessible from kubectl, which is really fantastic. So um, I think when we think about all of the, the roadmap, the stability, the security, and the um, extensibility pieces, uh, you kind of start to see the blueprints of how you would run in this hybrid enterprise environment with Kubernetes. So you'd have Kubernetes for the cloud native portion where developers can really develop fast and they can develop new applications 400 and, and, and deploy them 400 plus times a day. Uh, but ultimately, you know, that hopefully becomes something that's invisible. Um, you can use Istio to connect uh, you know, both the services that you have in your Kubernetes cluster as well as services that are running outside your Kubernetes cluster and uh, both visualize them as well as secure them. Uh, and then the open service broker hopefully becomes uh, that common catalog where you can consume services that are developed um, on Kubernetes, outside Kubernetes, and potentially in, in public clouds. So, so um, the, the benefits here being really that uh, with, these, with all of these pieces, uh, the, the team has essentially raised the level of abstraction and really decoupled deployment from development. Um, also decoupled the management of traffic and security uh, from the deployment. Uh, and then ultimately de decoupled the people who are consuming the services from the people who are developing the services. So it essentially kind of becomes like a SaaS-like infrastructure inside an, an, an IT environment. Um, and this is very similar to how Google operates. And so, um, you know, we're very excited <laughs> about seeing this happen in the rest of the world. Um, I think it's, it's quite differentiated from, um, you know, the way people have been thinking about hybrid cloud and, and enterprise IT in the past, because it's very much developer focused. It's services led and not infrastructure led. It incorporates legacy and modern at the, at, at, on the same infrastructure. And then ultimately it's open. So it can run anywhere, and it's multi-cloud. Um, so that's pretty much it. I think beyond, as I look at 2018, um, we are going to continue the focus on stability, graduating more of the APIs to stable. Um, we're going to focus heavily on conformance. The conformance program launched actually between 1.8 and 1.9, and OpenShift was part of that. There were 30-plus vendors um, that, that announced conformance. What this really means is that you can now run your uh, applications on Kubernetes and whether you go to Google or you go to some other cloud or you go to a, an, another vendor, those applications should run well um, across those different Kubernetes distributions. And that's extremely important to the, to the mission and the, and, and the purpose of Kubernetes is that you can run these services anywhere. Um, I think there's huge amount of work uh, on, on continuing security and enhancing security in Kubernetes, um, uh, building multi-tenancy into that, um, in, into Kubernetes at the pod level, at the uh, node level, um, at the namespace level, um, and, and of course augmenting that with Istio. So I think 2018 will be a huge year for that. You'll see really enterprise readiness on the security side. And then extensibility, so that you can build on top. You can add customization. Uh, I think also what you'll start to see is a focus on applications, so that the, the underlying infrastructure can start to disappear a bit, um, and there can be a much greater focus, even in the upstream code, on um, applications. Clayton talked a little bit about the definition of what is an application. That's a huge piece of what the community is going to be working on in 2018. So that's what I see beyond. Looking forward, um, I hope that you know in the future, once we've uh, you know once we've progressed further, everyone will be able to start writing code immediately. There's no need to file a ticket, um, and uh, you know they'll be able to reuse services um, out of the box uh, and secure them easily. Um, if there's a fault, you know, they'll recover quickly and they'll only pay for the resources they consumed um, and the, uh, and the infra infrastructure will essentially um, take care of all of that. So very much in line with the vision that uh, the TELUS folks said the applications will hopefully write themselves. That's it. Thank you.